Tonight on KQED Newsroom, news from the High Court, the legacy of Justice Anthony Kennedy, the fight to replace him, and some of the court's big rulings this week. And political analysis from publicly confronting Trump administration officials to turmoil in the Democratic Party following a stunning victory by a progressive. Plus, how one nonprofit is bringing free legal help to some of California's poorest and most vulnerable residents. Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. We begin with the United States Supreme Court. Just as Anthony Kennedy announced his retirement this week, the Sacramento native cast the swing vote on many momentous decisions, including rulings on abortion, same-sex marriage, and the Second Amendment. As the court ended its term this week, Kennedy sided with conservatives on two big cases affecting immigration and labor. Writing for the majority, Chief Justice Roberts rejected the argument that the ban was motivated by religious bias. Also, the Supreme Court rules that government workers cannot be forced to pay union dues if they choose not to join a union. The decision could have a big impact on California, where more than half of union members, such as first responders and teachers, work in the public sector. Joining me now to discuss all of this is UC Berkeley School of Law professor Melissa Murray and attorney Josh Protashnik, who clerks with Justice Kennedy from 2012 to 2013. Welcome to you both. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Professor Murray, let's begin with you. Who is at the top of the list of nominees, potential nominees, to replace Justice Kennedy? So there's a list of about 25 potential nominees, all vetted by the Heritage Foundation and the Federalist Society, two very conservative groups. Uh, the key words with all of these potential nominees is that they're reliably conservative. At the top of the list are Amy Coney Barrett, a judge from the Seventh Circuit, and Brett Kavanaugh, a judge on the D.C. Circuit. So these are the two front runners right now. And Judge Barrett has uh, in the past expressed her Catholic belief and her, and her belief that life begins at conception. We have Brett Kavanaugh, who was the te top deputy to independent counsel Ken Starr during the Bill Clinton investigation. Um, what, what's at the crux of all this? It seems like they are trying to avoid a Justice Souter situation, right? When George H.W. Bush uh, nominated him, he was confirmed, and he turned out to be a lot more liberal than conservatives had wanted. That's definitely true. They're looking for somebody who is going to be a reliable vote on the key issues that they think are going to come before the court in the coming years. Okay. And Josh, what are your biggest hopes and concerns about the next nominee and the whole nomination process? My biggest hope would be that um, whoever is the next member of the court um, tries to find a way to build consensus on the court. I think it's the court is in an increasingly a uh, difficult position where it's more polarized and divided than ever before, and I think they need to strive to build some consensus, but it's difficult to see how that's going to happen. Um, and my greatest fear is that the opposite of that, that it's just going to continue to be more and more polarized, and you're going to have a red team and a blue team on the court, just like you do in the other branches of government. Melissa? Well, I think that's exactly right. The court's incredibly polarized right now on sort of clear divisions, and I'm not hopeful that the person who will be selected, given the prospective nominees we've been offered, will be someone who will sort of broker a kind of peace between these two factions. The thing about Justice Kennedy is that he had, although he was quite conservative, he had the ability to sort of play in the joints a little bit. And so he could be unpredictable. I don't think we're going to get that kind of unpredictability in this nominee. And it seems that the most aggressive debate right now is over abortion. Um, Justice Kennedy co-authored the decision upholding Roe uh, v. Wade. There seems to be a general consensus, consensus, consensus that that won't be overturned, but it might be gutted over time, with re depending on who replaces Justice Kennedy. Well, I don't know that it's clear that Roe won't be overruled, and in fact, anticipating a vacancy, a number of pro-life groups have been seeding legislation at the lower court level. So there's a ban on a six week, an abortion at six weeks, a heartbeat law in Iowa, and that's making its way through the court. So they've been anticipating that there will be a new justice in a few years, and they've been seeding cases that could come up that will clearly frontally challenge Roe. So the idea that overruling Roe is off the table, I think that's fallacious. I mean, I think it's more likely that it will be incrementally undermined, but the the idea of a complete overruling is not beyond the pale here. Do you agree with that, Josh? Yes, I wouldn't make any predictions one way or another about the future of Roe and abortion rights. Okay. And there were major rulings this week. You know, the court as a whole issued uh, 
decisions on the travel ban, labor unions. There was a decision that said California cannot require uh, faith-based crisis pregnancy centers to provide information about abortion. Taken as a whole, what do those decisions tell you about the Supreme Court? It was a good term for conservatives at the court. You know, each term is a little bit different, and this term in most of the you know major cases that were closely watched. Um, the, the conservatives prevailed and Justice Kennedy sided with them um, in contrast to some prior years where, you know, in some of them he sided with the more liberal justices. It was a blockbuster term for conservatives on really key issues that were important to their base. So to the extent that conservatives voted for the court when they went to the polls in 2016, they got what they were looking for. And in the travel ban ruling, Chief Justice Roberts seized that moment to also finally overturn the um, Korematsu decision from 1944, that controversial decision where the Supreme Court upheld the Japanese internment. And in her dissent, Justice Sotomayor pointed out, well, there are parallels between the internment and the current travel ban. What's your take on that, Melissa? So, in my view, the overruling of Korematsu was a sop to liberals. I mean, overruling a decision that is sort of languished on the books as part of an anti canon of court decisions that really should have never happened. Um, but again, as Justice Sotomayor clearly said, there are remarkable parallels between the Japanese internment and what's been happening now, and certainly um, under all three iterations of the travel ban. So it's a kind of hollow overruling because we have overruled Korematsu on the one hand, but we've actually reinstated its logic in a lot of other ways. And your feelings on that, Josh? Well, obviously, everybody hates Korematsu, and it's nice to see it overruled. You know, I think the Chief Justice made the point, in his opinion, for the court that there are significant differences between this case and Korematsu, that Korematsu dealt with people who were American citizens in the United States, and that here you're talking about people who are not citizens and are not in the United States, and the president has much greater discretion in that area. And you clerked for Justice Kennedy. If we were to look back and, and take a look at his legacy, he's been progressive on some issues, such as gay marriage, yet conservative on others, including gun rights. How would you describe his approach to the law? Uh, that's a very good question. You know, he doesn't fit neatly into the boxes that most of the other justices often find themselves in. You know, I'd say he has some libertarian instincts. So in the examples you just gave are areas where both on the right side and on the left side, he voted to uphold individual rights. Um, and, and that's something that's certainly near and dear to his heart. He, he came from Sacramento. He was a California native. Do you think that that his California upbringing helped to shape how he views the law in the court? I think there are definitely seeds of it. Um, a few years ago when Perry versus Hollingsworth, that was the first same-sex marriage case, um, went up and the court um, sent it back on standing grounds. He talked about the idea of a public referendum process. And again, that sort of initiative process that's very near and dear to people in the West. And he talked a lot about it um, and how to preserve it as part of this decision. So I think you see aspects of that. I would say um, he has been incredibly progressive on certain individual rights, and that will clearly be part of his legacy. But he has a much more mixed record on individual rights insofar as it relates to race and to gender. So, I, I mean, he definitely has a libertarian streak, but it doesn't necessarily cover all aspects of the individual rights spectrum. So given that he's now stepping down, how different is this from the scenario when uh, Gorsuch replaced Scalia, right? Because that was a conservative replacing a conservative. Now we have this swing vote stepping down. How momentous is this moment for what happens next on the Supreme Court? It's very momentous. I think um, in anyone's estimation, the next justice is likely to move the court to the right on a number of issues. And the chief justice is probably going to emerge as a swing vote in quite a few cases. And so it will really become the Roberts court that people often refer to because he will be at the center of it, both literally as the chief justice, but also often as the swing vote. And let's not suggest that Gorsuch and Scalia were sort of tit for tat. Gorsuch is actually more to the right than even Scalia was on some core issues, especially in the area of administrative law. So we already have had some rightward drift on the court, and this next nominee will certainly send the court further to the right. All right. Much to watch in the, in the months to come. Professor Melissa Murray and also Attorney Josh Potashnik, thanks to you both. Thank you. Thank you.
On Tuesday, primary elections were held in five states, including New York. There, veteran Democrat Joseph Crowley suffered a stunning defeat to 28-year-old Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. A former organizer for Bernie Sanders, her victory may mark a turning point in the direction of the Democratic Party as they head into the fall elections. Also last weekend, California Congresswoman Maxine Waters generated controversy when she told supporters at a rally to publicly confront Trump administration officials. Democratic leaders Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi condemned her remarks, while President Trump took to Twitter to insult Waters, calling her a, quote, low IQ person. Joining me now for a deeper look at these issues are Democracy in Color President Amy Allison and San Francisco senior political writer Joe Garofoli. Nice to have you both back. Thank Great you. To be here. Joe, let's take a look at the political fight over the Supreme Court. Democrats want to hold off on the nominations until after the, the, the November elections, hoping a new crop of lawmakers can weigh in. Today, though, President Trump says he's going to name a nominee by July 9th. Is there anything Democrats can do at this point? Uh, pray, uh, that, because that's all they have to do. They, they don't have the numbers to make this happen. One option they do have is to just jam the process and just, you know, call roll call votes on everything. And But I don't know if they have the stomach to do that. They can say we don't want to, you know, Feinstein and Kamala Harris have come out and said we don't, we want to delay this. But they have no power to make that happen. They can try and swing a couple of, uh, of uh, Republican senators like Lisa Murkowski, uh, Susan, and, Collins, and Susan of Collins of Maine. But you know they might lose a couple because there's some Democrats and, and who are rep who are in tough re-election fights in states that Trump really won big, and he, they might lose them. So it's it, they they're not they don't have a lot of good options. I think uh, we need to really think about uh, the what the Democratic Party leadership's doing. What is Pelosi and Schumer's job? That is to whip up votes to support things. And we need to remember that um, the discipline with which the Republicans uh, mucked up the system and prevented uh, the la Obama's last Supreme mm -hmm. Court nominee, there's the playbook right there. Right. The Democrats, like you said, they have to have the stomach to do that. They have to have the will. And they have to hear from average people that that's what's expected. So much is at stake. But the Republicans are in the majority now. So realistically, what can the Democrats do? filibuster, roll call votes, uh, uh, slow down the system. There's uh, just a few uh, months until the midterm election. And the whole uh, issue with uh, the Supreme Court, so many things are at stake. Uh, uh, abortion rights and the overturning of Roe v. Wade, um, redistricting and uh, the effort of some states to suppress votes, particularly of people of color in, in places like Texas. So much is at stake that the Democrats need. It's, an, it's, a, it's a do or die moment for them. And right. so, so, so the, there's see, procedural issues, a procedural approach that they can have. And there's, that seat is going to be there for 30 years. I mean, yeah. this is like, or this more. is a generational how young seat. The judge yeah. Is. And yeah. so this is, but I don't know. I don't know if they have the stomach for it. I think that they, you know, they're, they're kind of bringing a, a, a pencil to a knife fight type of thing. And I, I don't know. They have not shown the past they were doing. They got rolled before. I don't, we will and, see. And they, do, they will take public pressure is the only thing they could. could and, and do they have the unity to do it, right? Because there's a lot of discord mm -hmm. in the Democratic Party right now. We saw that in New York with the race between Crowley and Ocasio-Cortez. You know, we have this young progressive. She's just 28 years old, a political newcomer, defeating someone who's number four uh, in the House on the Democratic side. And, and he was seen as a potential successor to Nancy Pelosi as House Speaker. What does this say about the state of the Democratic Party, Amy? It's exactly what we talked about, that uh, voters are ready for more courageous type of leadership. They're, uh, by supporting a newcomer who's uh, unabashed progressive politics and organizing, and as she said on late night television just uh, the other day, is that um, if, uh, you know, establishment Democrats typically look at who they believe votes and they ignore the full range of people who could vote, people aren't motivated by traditional leadership or lack of courage, that's how she won. That's the playbook we saw in other successful uh, progressive campaigns in Maryland and in Georgia for those gubernatorial races. So to uh, for me, what that uh, indicates is that uh, a party that's half people of color, a quarter black, are looking for a new type of leadership and are, are not um, accepting the fact that the leaders who have been in power for a long time um, should continue being status quo, not in the age of Trump. They want something new. What, what does the party another, leadership have to say, including Nancy Pelosi? Well, she was, you know, cordial to her afterwards. She said congratulations, but she didn't 
she didn't, they, didn't, they blew her off. They, nobody really gave her a chance. Ro yeah, Khanna. Ro Khanna was the Amy only congressman, that. yeah. Uh, and it was interesting to read her tweets. After she won the primary, she said, listen, uh, the establishment did not um, acknowledge me except uh, Congressman Ro Khanna. And here are the other uh, uh, independent efforts to help her with strategy and uh, online orga on, on the ground organizing and others. That's how she got through. And, and in fact, I think Pelosi even said, well, you know, look, this is a congressional race. It's one race in one district. New York is not necessarily representative of the nation, right? She kind of downplayed. She kind of downplayed. The but this is the problem with the party. Oh, they're still the have they're still chasing the working class white voters who voted for Trump. Those folks aren't going to vote for They're Democrats. They're not coming back. And I'm going to tell you, I heard some uh, uh, people talking uh, behind closed doors. Like, you know what? And Nancy Pelosi's gotten too comfortable, too. And that um, we're seeing in the state of California where there's a challenge to Dianne Feinstein, people are saying, why aren't uh, there more challenges amongst the Democratic Party for people who have been in power um, for a long time? So it's starting this conversation and also showing people that it's possible. And, and there's already a ripple effect. Joe, you wrote about this. Um, Oakland Congresswoman Barbara Lee is now interested in running for Crowley's position as chair of the House Democratic Caucus. What are her chances? Her chances, well, she's making calls now. She's thinking about it, and it looks like she'll probably run. Uh, if she won, she would be the, there has never been an African-American woman to have that high of a leadership in either party. It would be a momentous occasion. Now, Barbara Lee's challenge is she is the, the third most liberal, according to one of these metrics, uh, member of the House. She's going to have to prove to folks that, you know, she can work across the aisle, and she has in some ways. She has, a, a, you know, on HIV um, AIDS funding over the years. She's, she's actually worked with Republicans on that. Um, that's going to be her biggest challenge, is going to be, is she too far out there? Is she too California? See, I, is she too Oakland? I that's actually, what, re I reject, I reject the uh, characterization of Barbara Lee being too far out. Think of this. African American women has been it's been established are the highest vote turnout of any race and gender Democratic Party voters. I already said one of four Democrats are black. I think her politics represents the majority of the Democratic Party, the silent majority of the Democratic Party. I think it would be amazing, not only just historic, but what the party needs. And I cannot understate the fact that this kind of leadership um, is the only kind of leadership the Democrats uh, <laughs> can can look to to actually uh, prove to be a counterpoint to the Republicans who are 90 percent of the time uh, agreeing with Trump, the ones in Congress, and the fact that uh, the Supreme Court may be uh, pro-Trump policies means there is not a counterpoint. Mm -hmm. So working across the aisle to me, not as important as being an important counterpoint to the Trump administration. And how, and how much is the Democratic Party being hurt by, you know, what we saw play out this week, which is sort of this lack of civility, right? And then you have uh, uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters over a megaphone telling people to public, publicly confront Trump officials. Um, she was criticized by, by party leaders, but there's also this generation of activists that are saying, no, this is exactly what's needed. The Democratic Party has been weak. Right. And the, I did a comment the other day in the Chronicle about how she represents and uh, Alexandria represents standing up for something. Like, don't sort of do this sort of mealy mouth uh, move to the middle. And that's what's, uh, in this, a lot of these primary races, that's who's winning, is are people who are, who are taking more progressive positions and, and sort of standing up for stuff. Now, the, the whole civility thing is kind of a BS pushback by, uh, by, by Republicans and by Democrats. That's basically chilling the status quo. Because Pelosi and and Schumer represent the status quo, uh, and, and Trump for Trump to talk about civility. This is the guy who talks about punching. He's he has literally said I, I ought to punch him in the face. So I mean, you know, listen. Let's consider the sources where it's yeah, coming from. I, I saw John Legend said uh, the singer John Legend said, you know what? You can ask me about civility after you tell me about the more than two thousand kids that were taken from their parents at the border for the migrant families. Right. And so he's you know he's saying okay, we can talk about Sanders. Huckabee Sanders dinner later. Mm. And I think we're losing uh, touch with what's most important, uh, that democracy, for democracy to really work, it's messy. But that individual citizens have a right 
to not only have free speech, but to do something the Republicans and the Tea Party knew how to do very well, which is bird dogging. Remember, yeah. when uh, President Obama was trying to get health care passed, they went to every single town hall that featured a congressman, and they yelled, and they mm -hmm. screamed, and they protested, and they marched, and they got a lot of what they wanted. And so for Maxine Waters, who, by the way, incredibly brilliant, venerable uh, senior uh, congresswoman, black woman, she represents the base of the Democratic Party, to go back to her civil rights activist roots and say, I want to remind you that this is what you can do in a democracy is completely the right thing to do. Oh, this, and this for is... the party leadership to condemn her right. shows that they don't understand the base of who's actually in the party. I have to move on to immigration just real quickly as well, because the Republicans, of course, are facing their own issues, right? But they couldn't get immigration legislation passed. They twice delayed it. This week, they still couldn't get it passed. Um, and, and as many Republicans, nearly as many Republicans, voted against it as for it, so what does that say for the Republicans? What do they need to do to bridge that divide? Well, that's going to be their big challenge, and, and it's going to be hurting people. What we're going to see in California are in districts like Jeff Denham's district in the Central Valley, David Valadeo. These are two Republican congressmen who's, who have like 40% Latino population in their district, and they're like, they're feeling the heat. They know that this is an issue that they have to confront yeah. and resolve. But most of the rest of the, the Republicans live in these gerrymandered districts where they don't have to deal right. with this issue at all. So they're like, well, eh, I'm not into it. All right. We will have to leave it there for now. Amy Allison with Democracy in Color and yeah. Joe Garofoli with the San Francisco Chronicle. Mm -hmm. Always nice to have you guys in. Good Thanks. To be here. Thanks. For more than a decade, the nonprofit One Justice has provided free legal aid to thousands of low income Californians. They regularly hit the road with their Justice Bus, a program which brings lawyers and law students to rural parts of California where legal aid is scarce and out of reach for many. Their staff and network of volunteers help clients clear criminal records, fight evictions, and submit paperwork to become citizens or get permanent residency. To hear more about their work, the CEO of One Justice, Attorney Julia Wilson, joins me now in the studio. Hi, Julia. Good to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, One Justice was among the organizations that quickly mobilized at SFO and other airports across the country uh, to help affected travelers, most of whom were Muslims, mm -hmm. after the first version of President Trump's mm -hmm. travel ban took effect in 2017. What is your reaction now to the Supreme Court decision this week upholding the current travel ban? Uh, I mean, I think I can speak on behalf of the entire legal aid and civil rights community in saying how very disappointed we are. Um, and this decision will go down on the wrong side of history. You're disappointed why? Well, um, we believe firmly still that the president's very public comments around implementing a full ban on Muslims entering this country violates some of the core tenets of our of our justice system and our of our American values. Um, and uh, we know the Supreme Court has gotten these things wrong in the past around civil rights and race and LGBTQ issues, and um, they got this one wrong too. Um, and I think that Justice Sotomayor's dissent makes clear that our, con our Constitution and our country deserved a different outcome. On the issue of undocumented immigrants, President Trump has said there should not be due process for people who enter the U.S. illegally. What do you make of that statement? I mean, that is just antithetical to what we are as a country and the, the values that we have um, inscribed in our Constitution. And being a country that believes in the rule of law means that our Constitution applies to everyone who is here. We don't pick and choose. There's no favoritism. Uh, the rule of law is there to protect the human rights of everyone who has foot in this country. There's a lot of focus now on migrant families separated at the border. How is one justice of, uh, involved in this broader network of groups that are seeking to help them and other immigrants? We're part of a national coalition of lawyers and law firms and civil rights and immigration groups that are trying to make sure that these families are reunited. The, the court order out of San Diego on Tuesday makes it clear they have to do that in fairly short order. The question is now, these children have been part of a, a national shell game, right? They disappeared and it appeared in hundreds of shelters around the country. Uh, now that they are getting legal representation, how do we make sure that as they're re reunified, we don't lose sight of these children again? So what are you doing to assist? Do you have any actual cases you're handling right now? We are starting to see some of these children who have been separated from their parents showing up in the regular unaccompanied minor uh, caseloads in California. So 
one of our core partners, Esperanza in Los Angeles, they now have a six-year-old who was separated from her parents as a result of the zero tolerance. Mm -hmm. And we just yesterday sent out an email blast statewide uh, trying to find a, some representation for her. Okay. I want to talk about your um, Justice Bus program mm -hmm. as well. It's, it's rather innovative. It helps to bridge that legal, that gap, right, mm -hmm. in legal aid for people who are in remote areas, rural areas of California. How does that work, and what kinds of services do you provide? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you map the state, there are these high concentrations of poverty in rural areas, and then all the concentration of lawyers is in the metropolitan centers. So we literally put lawyers and law students on buses, train them, get them out to rural areas and do pop-up mobile legal clinics um, in 75% of the state where there are, are pockets of need. And so those folks focus on immigration, anything to do with uh, folks who are able to become citizens or DACA assistance or just general immigration screening for folks who don't even know what their status or their possible remedies are. Um, and then also folks who have some criminal history that's preventing them from accessing jobs or housing, how do they clean up that record and, and be able to move on with their lives? We've heard about how the criminal justice system disproportionately impacts poor people mm -hmm. and people of color. How does the civil uh, justice system have a similar disproportionate impact on those populations? Yeah, we know that low-income folks and particularly communities of color are, are disproportionately regulated, including in the civil justice system. So something like three quarters of the people who need to access help through the civil justice system are people of color in addition to being low income. Um, and so it's incredibly important that we understand how these interlocking moments of, uh, of, of discrimination impact these populations. And, and there's a cascading effect, right? What percentage of your clients are close to the verge of homelessness? And because you have said that for many of these problems, one legal problem leads to many others. Yeah, so all of our clients are living at 125% of the federal poverty level or lower. So these are folks who are living paycheck to paycheck. They are at extreme risk. And what happens is that if you're working at a job and your employer won't pay your overtime, and then you're having a disagreement with your landlord and you can't pay the rent, and then you can't get access for your kids, I mean, access to food for your kids, you're gonna end up experiencing three to seven civil justice system problems all at once. And that's how the, their problems just keep accumulating mm -hmm. and becomes a bigger and bigger problem. And you, you, you were once a legal aid attorney for children with disabilities yeah. and their parents. What did that experience show you about the justice system for disabled and low-income people? Yeah, the thing I think I learned so much from my clients um, was that there is this incredible barrier to accessing help. And that without a lawyer sitting shoulder by shoulder with them, even these parents who were fierce advocates for their children, uh, they needed the voice of a lawyer to amplify their efforts. Uh, but when we worked together with their advocacy and their understanding and my access to the legal system, we could literally transform the lives of their children. And that's the experience that you bring now to your work at One Justice. Julia Wilson, thank you so much. Thank you. And that will do it for us. Next week, please tune in for a KQED Newsroom special. We'll bring you some of the best interviews from our archives with innovative and influential figures in modern art, theater, and comedy. As always, you can find more of our coverage at kqed.org newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Thank you for joining us.